These forests at the foot of the Ko'olau Mountains receive more rainfall than any other part of the islands of Oahu, upwards of 60 inches on average per year. Now, here in Hawaii, the rains do come hard, but they also pass fairly quickly. And when a nice good rain passes through, it causes the forest streams and waterfalls to flow a little bit more quickly. Now this is actually parallel to the main idea that we're studying in this lecture, which is the more chemical reactant there is, the faster the reaction flows. So stay tuned for the differential rate law. Aloha. In our previous lecture, we discussed the chemical reaction rate. And you should remember that the rate is defined as a change in a quantity in a given amount of time. For example, the speed of a car can be measured and calculated as change in distance divided by change in time, so your units may be miles per hour. For the reaction rate, we're using change in concentration over change in time, and our units are molarity per second. Now, we studied a specific reaction, and then we formulated the general case. So let's recall that general case for a moment. Here's that generic reaction we see so often. Reactants A and B form products C and D. Now, in this reaction, there are four species, A, B, C, and D, therefore four rates that we can describe. For example, the rate of change of reactant A would be change in concentration of A divided by change in time. Now, what are these other factors that are preceding the four rates? Well, the reason that you have to precede the four rates with these other factors is that these four rates are not necessarily equal to each other by themselves. And the reason for that is twofold. First of all, the reactant concentrations are decreasing as the reaction proceeds, so their rates would be negative. And the product concentrations are increasing, their rates would be positive. And second, these coefficients, little a, little b, little c, and little d, are not the same. And that means that the magnitudes of the four rates would not necessarily be the same. So to alleviate these two discrepancies, we precede the rates with these factors. And if you precede the reactants by negative one over their coefficients and the products by positive one over their coefficients, then that makes the rates, the four of them, equivalent. And you would end up getting one answer. And that answer you could call the rate of this chemical reaction. Now in this lecture, we're going to discuss a new way to formulate the rate of a chemical reaction. And this is called the differential rate law, or simply the rate law for short. What this involves is studying a reaction in the laboratory over and over and over. And once you study a reaction under multiple circumstances and you understand its kinetics well enough, you can formulate what's called the rate law for this chemical reaction. And once you know the rate law, then you can use the rate law to predict how fast the reaction would go in new situations that you haven't even studied yet. So you can see how a rate law would be very useful to know. And every chemical reaction has its own rate law. So to see how we find a rate law for a chemical reaction, uh, let's take a look. First of all, we should understand that the reaction rate is related to the concentrations of the reacting species. Now this is well known and it's easy to understand. For example, if you study a chemical reaction where the reactants are very dilute, then collisions between the reactant molecules would not be occurring very often, and the chemical reaction would not occur very often as well.
So that would be a slow reaction. But if you do the same chemical reaction and you put very concentrated reactants in there, then the reactants would be colliding with each other very often and the chemical reaction would be happening all the time and that would be a very fast reaction. So the rate definitely depends on the concentrations. Now, let's look at this example. The chemical reaction that occurs between fluorine gas and ClO2 gas. This reaction has been studied under three different experimental conditions. And in these three experiments, different reactant concentrations were used and the rate of these three experiments was determined. Now, the initial rate was determined, and the reason for that is because if you try and determine the rate at some further point during the reaction, then these concentrations have diminished by then, and along with that, once the product has started to appear, the reverse reaction can start to occur, and so that can complicate matters. So to avoid those complications, we're only interested in the initial rates. So right at the beginning, we know exactly how much reactant we have, and we know exactly how fast it's going. And once you have this data, you can then assess the situation. So for example, for the first experiment, the reactant concentrations are both 0.1 molarity, and the initial rate was determined. And for the second experiment, the fluorine concentration is kept the same, but the ClO2 concentration is quadrupled. And look what happens to the rate. The rate is also quadrupled. Now, quadrupling the concentration means quadrupling the rate. Well, that's a linear relationship. So you could say that the rate is directly proportional on, onto the concentration. So directly proportional means that if you double the concentration, the rate should double. If you triple the concentration, the rate should triple. And if you quadruple the concentration, the rate should quadruple. And that's the situation that we see here. So the rate is directly proportional to the ClO2. Now to see how the rate depends on the F2, let's use experiments one and three. In experiments one and three, the other reactant is held constant, but the fluorine is doubled. And we can see that that doubles the rate. Again, a linear relationship. So we can formulate this in a mathematical relationship right here. The rate is directly proportional to both the fluorine and the ClO2. We can turn that relationship into an equation by putting a constant in there. So the rate equals a constant times the fluorine concentration times the ClO2 concentration. So this rate law then describes this reaction. Now this constant we call the rate constant. And once we know the rate constant, which is easy to figure out with this data, then all we have to do is substitute in any concentrations and we can calculate how fast the reaction would go in that situation. So it's a very useful equation to know. Now let's look at the general case. For our generic reaction, A plus B form products C and D, the rate law would be as follows. The rate is equal to a rate constant times the concentration of A raised to the nth power times the concentration of B raised to the mth power. Now this rate constant is temperature dependent. At different temperatures the rate constant would change. And so if you know the rate constant at one temperature, at a higher temperature, the rate constant is probably a little bit larger. We'll talk about that later. And the exponents here, n and m, are called the orders. n is the order with respect to a, and m is the order with respect to b.
you can also ask about the overall reaction order and that would simply be N plus M. So let's see how this applies to our example reaction. For this reaction, we see that it's first order in fluorine, first order in ClO2, but second order overall. In our previous slide, we saw that a reaction is considered to be first order in a reactant if doubling the concentration of the reactant means doubling the rate, or tripling the concentration means tripling the rate, and so on. That's first order. But there are other possibilities. Suppose we had doubled the concentration of a reactant, but instead of doubling the rate, it quadrupled the rate. That would be second order for that reactant. Now suppose we had doubled the concentration of a reactant, but the rate had no effect. In other words, changing the concentration had no effect on the rate. Well then, it would be zero order for that reactant. And there are other orders as well, third order and so on. But zero, first, and second order are probably the most common situations. But other than that connection between changing the concentration and observing how it changes the rate, what else does the order actually mean in terms of what the chemical situation is? In other words, what sort of chemical situation would correspond with zero first or second order kinetics? Another way to put it is if we can look at what the molecules are actually doing, then what are the molecules doing in a second order reaction that's any different than what they would be doing in a first order or even a zero order reaction? How do we explain the kinetics by looking at the molecules? So let's take a closer look at the order of a reaction by examining certain chemical situations that correspond with those orders. And I think by doing that, we'll understand kinetics a little bit better. Let's look at the simplest case first. That's for the zero order reaction. Here's our generic reaction again. Reactant A forms product B. Now the rate law for this reaction takes on a simple form, the rate equals a constant times the concentration of A raised to the zero power. Anything raised to the zero power equals one, so this reduces to just the constant. Now, the units of the rate constant here are molarity per second. We'll see that first order and second order reactions have different units of K, but for a zero order reaction, the units of the rate constant are always molarity per second. And that's because the units on the left side of the equation are, have to be equal to the units on the right side. The units of the rate we know are molarity per second, so the units of K must also be molarity per second. Now, this equation is telling us that the rate is constant, that it is independent of the concentration of A. There is no concentration of the reactant over here, so the rate should not depend on it. What sort of chemical situation would correspond with this? In other words, it doesn't matter how much reactant you have, the chemical reaction proceeds at the same speed. Well, a popular example is that of an enzyme or a protein. These two are the same thing. What a protein is, is a biological catalyst. A catalyst is a chemical that speeds up a chemical reaction without being used up. So a biological catalyst speeds up a reaction inside the cell. Now every cell has lots of different proteins and each protein catalyzes a specific reaction. What a protein actually is, is an amino acid polymer. A polymer is a long chain of similar molecules that are attached together over and over and over again. So an amino acid polymer is a long chain of amino acid molecules attached together. That's what a protein is. Here's an example of an amino acid. This is glycine. Over here we have alanine, and over here we have serine. Three different amino acids. 
They all have similar structures. The glycine is different from the alanine because of the identity of the side chain that is attached to this carbon atom. Here the side chain is just a hydrogen. Over here, for the alanine, the side chain is a CH3 group, and for the serine, the side chain is CH2OH. So different amino acids have different side chains, and that's what makes them different. Now a protein is what you have when the amino acids are connected together through covalent bonds. So to connect these three amino acids and make a, a really small protein of just three amino acids connected, what you'd have to do is connect this carbon atom to that nitrogen atom. And when you do that, water would end up detaching. Now to connect the alanine to the serine, again, this carbon atom attaches to that nitrogen atom. In doing that, another water molecule would end up detaching. So this is called a condensation reaction because water ends up detaching. So through this polymerization, let's see what we get. Here is your product. Here you have your glycine attached to the alanine, attached to the serine. Now, the glycine is called the N-terminus because it ends with the nitrogen. And the serine is called the C-terminus because it ends with a carbon. So the two are different ends of the protein. Now these atoms that are highlighted in red are called the backbone atoms of the protein. And the backbone atoms are connected together by single bonds. And because single bonds can rotate, that means the backbone is a very flexible portion of the protein. Now if you imagine a very long chain of amino acids, like maybe a hundred or even a thousand amino acids connected together, that would be a very long flexible molecule. Now what happens inside the cell is that molecule actually collapses together. And that's because of the forces of interaction between one amino acid and another amino acid several units down the chain. You can get hydrogen bond interactions between the NH of one amino acid and the C double bond O of another amino acid further down the chain. You can also get dipole, dipole, and van der Waals interactions as well. So all of these interactions cause the protein to sort of collapse in on itself. And as these forces cause the protein to collapse, you have these interesting shapes which sort of appear. The backbone can form these little helical type of structures called alpha helices. The backbone can also kind of zigzag back and forth in what are called beta sheets. And most proteins have an alpha helix in there or a beta sheet or maybe multiple alpha helices and beta sheets. And also, these large shapes can also kind of collapse in on themselves. So what you end up with is a very large globular shaped molecule that somehow makes an environment for a chemical reaction. Now we know that proteins catalyze chemical reactions at a constant rate. So how would a protein molecule do this? Well let's take a closer look. Here's an example of a chemical reaction that occurs within every single cell, and that is folic acid reacts with NADPH, which is short for nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide phosphate. Now these two molecules react to form certain product molecules. This chemical reaction is very important because the product tetrahydrofolate then goes on to perform necessary reactions that are important for generating DNA. So this chemical reaction helps generate the precursor to DNA. Now, this reaction is very slow by itself, but with the proper protein to speed this reaction up, it can proceed at a good rate. So the protein here is called dihydrofolate reductase, or DHFR for short, and this is a large globular shaped protein which really is a long chain of amino acids. Now this 
protein molecule kind of looks like a Pac-Man, actually. And what happens is the folic acid molecules kind of line up over here. The NADPH molecules kind of line up over there. And as a folic acid attaches to the protein through van der Waals, dispersion, dipole-dipole, hydrogen bond types of interactions, when the folic acid attaches to the actual protein, it is deformed. See, the reactant molecules are deformed as they bind to the protein. The protein molecule kind of forms a surface on which the reactant molecules attach. And as they attach, they're deformed a little bit. The bonds are twisted, the angles are kind of bent a little bit. And the reactant molecules are deformed in such a way as to facilitate the chemical reaction. And not only that, this protein is constantly vibrating back and forth at its own frequency. Proteins vibrate with a certain frequency that sort of depends on the protein itself. Reactant molecules, when they attach, that doesn't really affect the frequency of vibrational motion that much. Now, each vibrational motion brings the folic acid and NADPH in close proximity, and bam, that's when the chemical reaction can occur. And when the chemical reaction occurs, the molecules have changed their identity. The enzyme senses that something else is different. Maybe the forces of interaction change, and those product molecules end up leaving. And after the product molecules leave, then new reactant molecules can attach. And so what you have is the protein operating at its own speed, and it doesn't matter how many folic acids are waiting in line or how many NADPHs are waiting in line, the reaction goes at a constant rate. So the reaction rate depends on how fast the protein vibrates, not on reactant concentrations. So that's an example of a zero order reaction where the rate is constant. A reaction is first order if its rate law has the form rate equals a constant times the concentration of the reactant raised to the first power. Here the constant has units of per second, or seconds to the negative one, and we can determine that from the rate law because the rate on the left side has units of molarity per second, so the units on the right side must also combine together to give us molarity per second. And concentration raised to the first power gives us molarity, so that leaves the constant with units of per second. And multiplying those two units, we get molarity per second. In a first order reaction, the rate is directly proportional to the concentration of the reactants. So doubling the concentration of A doubles the rate, tripling the concentration triples the rate, and so on. A well-known example of a chemical situation that corresponds with first order kinetics is nuclear decay. Now, a nuclear reaction occurs when the nucleus of an atom changes. This means that in a nuclear reaction, an atom can actually change its type. So a carbon atom in the reactants may end up as a nitrogen atom in the products. This does not happen in chemical reactions. In chemical reactions, a carbon will always be a carbon, and a nitrogen will always be a nitrogen. But although this is a course in chemistry, it is good to be aware of what nuclear reactions might look like. And also, studying this example will help us better understand first order kinetics. So here's an example of a certain nuclear reaction. Here, thorium. 227 isotope reacts to form radium 223 and helium 4. If you recall from first semester, in this isotope, the 227 represents the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. Now, all thorium atoms have 90 protons. That's what it means for an atom to be thorium. So 227 minus 90 means that this isotope has 137 neutrons. What happens in this reaction is this 
nucleus, remember this is a nuclear reaction, so we're not looking at the atom here. We're only focusing on the nuclei. So the nucleus of this atom actually splits apart into two smaller pieces. The larger piece is called the daughter nuclide because it comes from the parent nuclide. So the parent breaks down into the daughter. And then this other smaller piece over here, this helium-4, is actually a common particle that's emitted in nuclear reactions, and it's called an alpha particle. Now, the kinetics of nuclear reactions are pretty well understood, and they're often described by their half-life. The half-life for this reaction is 18.68 days. And this means that if we start with, say, 100 atoms of thorium-227, then according to this reaction, they'll, after 18.68 days pass, we'll only have 50 of them remaining. And if we wait another 18.68 days, we'll have 25 remaining. So after this much time passes, half of your reactant reacts. Now, the half-lives of nuclear reactions appear to be constant. So it always seems to be 18.68 days, and that means half of your reactant disappears. Well, this will help us see why nuclear reactions are first order. But let's take a look at a simpler, more generic case Here's a nuclear reaction. A forms B, and this one has a half-life of 10 seconds. Now what we do is we run two experiments in parallel, and in the first container, we put a certain concentration of the reactant. It doesn't matter how much, so we'll call it X amount. And let's just suppose that it is eight atoms of the reactant. And down here in the other container, we double the concentration, so 16 atoms. Now, after 10 seconds passes, half of our reactant disappears. It turns into B. So in the first container, we're left with four atoms of A. It's difficult to predict which atoms will decay. It just appears to be random. Perhaps if you were able to look inside the nucleus and better understand the forces, you might be able to predict. But from the outside, it just seems to be random. So maybe this one, this one, this one, and this one will decay. So you're left with four atoms after 10 seconds. Now down here, half of the atoms decay. So you're left with eight atoms of reactant. Now another 10 seconds passes half of the reactant disappears again. So up here, if you start with four, then you're left with two. And down here, if you start with eight, then you're left with four. And finally, another 10 seconds passes. So up here, you're left with one. And down here, you're left with two. Well, in this example, it's easy to see that in the bottom container, the rate is twice as quick. We can see that using the first two sets of data. From zero to 10 seconds, up in the top container, four atoms have reacted. But down in the bottom container, eight atoms have reacted. So that's twice as fast, eight versus four. You can also go from zero to 30 seconds. In the first container, from zero to 30 seconds, seven atoms have reacted, but down here, 14 atoms have reacted. So again, twice as fast. So doubling the concentration of the reactant means doubling the rate. And that's first order kinetics, and that gives us this rate law. Now, a common extra credit problem that I assign in my classes here at Leeward Community College is the following. Thorium-219 isotope undergoes alpha decay, kind of like this one over here, but with a half-life of 1.05 microseconds. So how long does it take for one mole to decay and only one atom remain?
Now, this is a little challenging problem, but in order to answer it, take a look at this top container up here. If you start with eight atoms, then how long did it take for only one atom to remain? Well, it had to go through one, two, three half-lives for only one atom to remain. And what we did was we took our initial number of atoms, eight, and we multiplied it by a half times another half times another half in order to be equal to one. So that was three half-lives, and that's 30 seconds since the half-life is 10 seconds. So using that example, I think that might help you better understand how to answer this extra credit problem. Now in this online course, of course I cannot award you with extra credit, but it will still help you brush up your skills. So see if you can have a go at that. If a chemical reaction proceeds without any outside help, such as that of a catalyst, then it's probably second order. So in that respect, this would be the most common case. Now for some generic reaction, A forms B. If this reaction is second order, then its rate law is rate equals a constant times the concentration of A squared. And this time the units of the rate constant are one over molarity, one over second, or molarity to the negative one, second to the negative one. And again, we determine these units using the rate law because the units of the rate are molarity per second, so the units on the right side must also combine together to give us molarity per second. And concentration squared gives us molarity squared, so that leaves the constant with units of one over molarity, one over second. And multiplying these units with those units, we also get molarity per second on the right side as well. Now this rate law is telling us that the rate is directly proportional to the concentration squared. And that's telling us that doubling the concentration means actually quadrupling the rate. So that's different than first order, where doubling the concentration doubled the rate. Here, doubling the concentration of the reactant quadruples the rate. And we can see that by setting the reactant concentration equal to some value. It doesn't matter what it is, so let's just call it x. And if we substitute x in to the rate law, then we get the rate as kx squared. Now, doubling the concentration of the reactant, we substitute 2x into the rate law, and we see how it reduces to 4kx squared. So doubling the concentration of A quadruples the rate. Now the model that corresponds with second order kinetics is most often the collision model. In the collision model, a chemical reaction occurs whenever reactant molecules collide together. So if you have reactant molecules that are flying around, whenever they collide together, that's when a chemical reaction can occur. And therefore, the more often collisions occur, the faster the reaction rate is. So that should make sense. This diagram will help us understand it a little bit better. Suppose we have a different generic reaction. A plus B form product C. So two different reactant molecules this time. It's a little bit easier to see second order kinetics when you have two different reactants. So suppose inside of this container we have reactant molecules that are flying around and perhaps a couple of product molecules have already formed. Now whenever a molecule of A collides with the molecule of B, then a reaction can occur. It looks like these two are flying in different directions, so a collision probably will not occur right here, at least not yet. But in some other parts of the container, these two reactant molecules look like they're about to collide, and so here a product molecule would form. So a collision would occur right here and right there. And the more often collisions occur, the faster the rate of product formation.
Now we can see how this leads to second order kinetics with this diagram over here. Suppose we have that same generic reaction again. A plus B forms product C. And here, this would give us the rate law, the rate equals a constant, times the concentration of A to the first power times the concentration of B to the first power. So although it's first power in A, first power in B, it's second order overall. So let's look at the collision model for this reaction that would lead to this rate law. Suppose we have four different reaction containers, A, B, C, and D. And in the first container, we put two molecules of A and two molecules of B. And we count the number of collisions that can occur. This molecule of A can collide with that B or that B. So that's two collisions. But you also have this molecule of A can collide with that one or that one. So there are four different types of collisions that can occur in this container. So, and this container would proceed at a certain rate. Now suppose over here we double the concentration of A and we leave the concentration of B the same. And we count the number of collisions. We would have one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven, eight. So there are twice as many collisions that can occur over here in container B. So this container, the reaction would go twice as fast because there are twice as many collisions that can occur. And likewise, suppose again, we do the reaction, but we leave the concentration of A alone and we double the concentration of B. And we count the collisions and again, we count one, two, three, four, and five, six, seven, eight. So again, we would get twice as many collisions in container C. Now, again, that would tell us the reaction would be twice as fast than this container. But suppose we double all of the reactant. So we put four molecules of A and four molecules of B. And we count the collisions here. We get one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. So this time, doubling all of the reactant, we get four times the number of collisions. So in reaction vessel D, the rate should be four times as fast because collisions would occur four times as often. So to reiterate, doubling the concentration of A collisions are two times as often. Doubling the concentration of B, collisions are two times as often as well. So it should be first order in A and first order in B. And when we double the concentration of A and B, then collisions are four times as often. So that's a second order situation. Doubling all of the reactant, the rate is four times as fast, so that's second order kinetics, and that would give us this rate law. Now, I do wanna make note of what a third order reaction might look like. Suppose there is a three body collision that occurs, and reactant molecules A, B, and C form some products. Now this reaction proceeds by a three body collision, which means that these particles have to collide together at the same place and at the same time. And if we analyze that situation where all three of these particles collide together, and if we analyze it in a similar method, we would see that this reaction would be first order in A, first order in B, and first order in C, therefore third order overall. Now, although a three-body collision would give us third-order kinetics, this situation is actually very rare. Rarely do three particles that are flying around meet at the same place and at the same time. So this doesn't happen very often.
Nevertheless, we do see third order chemical reactions. So when you see a third order chemical reaction, you might question whether or not it proceeds by a three body collision. And it usually does not. The way third order chemical reactions proceed are usually through two or more steps. Third order reactions usually occur in two or more steps, which is the mechanism for this reaction. So a chemical reaction might proceed in one step and then the products of the first reaction would go on to react in a second step, possibly a third and a fourth step. And if you add together all of the steps of the reaction to get the overall reaction, which is the one that you're interested in, then this reaction might have a third order rate law, but that's not through a three body collision. It's usually because it occurs through a sequence of two body collisions. So you have a sequence of second order reactions and when you add together you get an overall reaction which exhibits third order kinetics and so that would be the actual mechanism. Now that's actually a jump ahead. We'll be talking about mechanisms a little bit more in a later video but I wanted to make a quick mention of that. With our better understanding of the order of a chemical reaction, let's now take a closer look at determining an actual rate law. And we'll choose the following reaction, the one that occurs between BF3 and NH3. So these two reactant molecules combine together to give one larger molecule. The rate law for this reaction takes the form rate equals a constant, times the concentration of BF3 raised to the N power times the concentration of NH3 raised to the M power. Now, a popular method for determining a rate law is to study the reaction in the laboratory and run multiple experiments in which the concentrations of the reactants are varied and the corresponding reaction rates are measured. So we basically set up three different experiments and we put different concentrations of reactants and we see how fast they go. It's a pretty simple procedure. Now suppose we collect this data during our experiment. Then to use this data to determine the rate law, we will need to determine K as well as the orders N and M. And the first thing that we do is determine the orders. To find the order with respect to one of the reactants, we look for two experiments in which one of the concentrations is held constant. Looking at experiments one and two, we see that the concentration of NH3 is held constant, but the concentration of BF3 is doubled this is going to let us determine the order with respect to BF3. And the way we do that is to take these two sets of data that we collected and substitute them both into the rate law. So experimental one data, we get the rate equals a constant times the concentration of BF3 raised to the N power times the concentration of NH3 raised to the M power and we repeat this using experiment two data. So we have two equations here, and of course we still do not know the rate constant or the two orders. But with these two equations, we can divide them both by each other. And when you divide two equations, you divide the left sides and you set that equal to the right sides divided by each other. And look what happens to the right side of this larger equation here. The rate constant is in both the numerator and the denominator, so it cancels out. And also, this factor over here cancels out as well. And what we're left with is the fraction on the left-hand side, as well as this fraction on the right-hand side. Now, since both of these factors are raised to the n power, we just surround that larger fraction and raise it to the n power. Now, this smaller equation, 
we can see that the left side is exactly equal to one half. And inside the parentheses on the right side, we also have one half. So we're left with one half equals one half raised to the n power. So n must be equal to one. So the order with respect to BF3 is first order. To find the order with respect to NH3, we do the same process, but we look for experiments in which the BF3 is held constant. So we can see that that's experiments one and three. So we take experiments one and three data and we substitute them into the rate law and we get these two equations for experiments one and three. Now, skipping a couple steps, we can see that the rate constant would cancel and these factors would cancel as well and we'd be left with this smaller equation. On the left hand side, this is exactly equal to one third and inside the parentheses over here, we also have one third. So one third equals one third raised to the m power. m must also be equal to one. So we now have the orders with respect to the two reactants. It's first order in both. And the next step is to determine the rate constant. So to find K, it's a pretty simple procedure. We just write our rate law as we know it so far. And we can see that rate equals K times the concentration of BF3 raised to the one power times the concentration of NH3 raised to the one power. And we can choose any experiment now and plug the data into the rate law that we know. So let's just take experiment one data since the numbers are the simplest. We take this data and we substitute it in. And the only thing that we need to solve for is K. So it ends up K equals 3.5. We could have used experiment two or experiment three data and we would end up with the same K. So our rate law ends up being rate equals 3.5 times the concentration of BF3 raised to the first power times the concentration of NH3 raised to the first power. And since this is a second order reaction, notice that the units of the rate constant are molarity to the negative one, second to the negative one. So this is a second order reaction, and we might think and wonder what the mechanism might be. Since we know that collision model gives second order kinetics, we might suspect that this reaction occurs by the collision model. Now, we're not sure of that, but it would be a pretty good guess. Let's go through another example of finding the rate law. And this example is slightly more difficult than the first one. This time, let's choose the reaction. H2 reacts with NO to form products. Now, using a similar method, we study this reaction in the laboratory perform multiple experiments with different reactant concentrations and measuring the corresponding reaction rates. And to determine the rate law, again, we first find the orders. So the rate law will have the following form. Rate equals a constant times the concentration of H2 raised to the N power times the concentration of NO raised to the M power. And we find two experiments in which one of the concentrations is held constant and the other one changes. So experiments one and two will help us determine the order N with respect to the hydrogen. So we plug in these sets of data into the rate law and we get this over here. So skipping a couple of steps, we see that when we divide these two equations, the rate constants would cancel, as well as this factor over here. And we'd end up with this simpler equation. Now, on the right hand side, we see that this is exactly equal to one half inside the parentheses. But on the left hand side, this is not equal to exactly one half. If you take two times 
0.00522, then you would get 0 0.01044. But that's not the case here. This is almost one half. So how do we solve exactly for the exponent in this case? Well, what we can do is take advantage of the property of logarithms. If we take the natural logarithm of the left-hand side of the equation and the natural logarithm of the right-hand side, we would get this new equation. And logarithms have that property. When you take the log of a factor raised to an exponent, that exponent can come down in front of the logarithm. And so we end up with this equation right here, and now it's pretty simple to solve for n. And we end up getting n is equal to the fraction of the two logarithms. In solving this, we get n equals 0.9946. So n is almost equal to 1, but not quite. And that's because doubling the concentration of the hydrogen almost doubles the rate. So n is almost equal to 1. We'll go ahead and round it to 1 in the final rate law, but for now let's leave it as the unrounded value. Now to solve for the other order, we repeat this process, except we use experiments 1 and 3. Hydrogen concentration is held constant, but the NO is doubled. And we see that that changes the rate a little bit. So we take these two sets of data and we substitute them into the rate law. And again, skipping a couple of steps, if we divide both of these equations, the rate constants cancel and this factor also cancels and we're left with this smaller equation over here. Now again, the right hand side inside the parentheses equals exactly one half. But the left hand side doesn't look like it simplifies exactly. It's almost one-fourth, but not quite. If you take four times the numerator, we would get 0 0.02088. But we get a little bit larger than that. So this is not exactly one-fourth. So again, the way we solve for the exponent here is to use the property of logarithms and doing a similar method, we would end up with m equals this fraction of the logarithms, the natural log of the ratio of the rates divided by the natural log of the ratio of the concentrations. And this time, m equals 2.005517. So m is a little teeny bit larger than 2. We'll round it to 2, but it's a little bit larger than 2 because when we double the concentration of NO, the rate is a little bit more than quadrupled. So that's second order, but since it's a little bit more than quadrupled, the exponent is a little bit larger than two. So leaving it unrounded for the time being, let's now calculate the rate constant. So to calculate the rate constant, we write our rate law as we know it so far and we choose any of the three experiments and we substitute the data into the rate law. So let's pick experiment number one, since the numbers are the simplest, and we substitute this data in. So the rate is equal to the constant times the concentrations raised to their unrounded powers. Now we can solve for the rate constant pretty easily. We'll call it K1 since we used experiment one data. And we get uh, the rate constant equals 5.2214. Now, if we choose experiment number two and we substitute that data in and we calculate the rate constant from it, it ends up being slightly different, 5.2209. And if we choose experiment three data and we substitute it in, we get 5.2214. This time the three rate constants are almost exactly the same, but not quite exactly the same. And that's because there was a little bit of discrepancy 
in the rate. They weren't exactly doubled or exactly quadrupled. So that means the rate constants are not quite exactly the same. So what we would do is we would take the average of these three rate constants and within sig figs we get 5.22. So our final rate law is rate equals 5.22 times the concentration of H2 raised to the one power times the concentration of NO raised to the two power. Now this is a third order reaction overall and therefore the units, if you work them out, are molarity to the negative two, second to the negative one. So this is a third order reaction. And if we wonder what the mechanism for this reaction might be, you might suspect that it occurs through a three body collision. Because if you remember from our slide a couple of slides ago, three body collisions result in third order kinetics. But you should recall that three body collisions are rare. So I don't know if I would propose that mechanism for this reaction. If I were to propose a mechanism for this reaction, I would suspect that it most likely occurs by a multi-step mechanism. So in other words, this reaction probably proceeds through a couple of steps and the two steps would add together to give this larger reaction. We will see this reaction in a couple of videos again when we talk about reaction mechanisms. In our next lecture, we'll take a look at a different formulation of the rate of the chemical reaction. In that time, we'll be looking at what's called the integrated rate law. So we've been discussing the differential rate law. Next time, we'll go through integrated rate law. So stay tuned. Aloha.